Hey everyone, I'd like to go over a couple problems on yesterday's practice sheet. And uh, one of them we'll actually use then as a bit of a segue into today's lesson. Now, uh, just kind of highlighting a couple key moments in a couple of these problems. For example, number three, whoops, I thought I could slide that. Uh, number three, we'll just leave it where it is. Uh, it's got a slant asymptote. Notice that that slant asymptote um, uh, is drawn with a dashed line, uh, but the graph, of course, only approaches the slant as you go uh, to infinity. That's always a slant only applies to infinity, which kind of relates a bit to number four, where we are crossing the slant asymptote um, at zero three. Uh, well, excuse me, we're not crossing it at zero three. We're actually crossing it uh, right at this little spot uh, but the point is that you, since you're passing through zero three, you're gonna have to cross that slant asymptote and that's okay. That's okay because a slant only applies to infinity. And of course, infinity means at the ends of the graph. So you can cross a slant. Don't forget that the denominator is still the culprit for your vertical asymptotes. So we still have these vertical asymptotes. And vertical asymptotes always split a graph into these, the uh, sort of the, the different intervals, if you will. Uh, so for this problem, we have the interval to the left of the asymptote, to the middle of the asymptotes, and then to the right of the asymptotes. So vertical asymptotes are still the key culprits to these problems. Now, number seven, I just put this on here because I wanted to mention that you should be able to find both the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts without a calculator. You should be able to uh, correctly set the equation equal to zero as well as set the, or excuse me, plug in zero uh, to get each of those intercepts. Notice that a horizontal asymptote also applies, but only to infinity. Now, it's number nine that you may have noticed has kind of something different. Although it's not brand new, we talked about it the very first day. It's definitely something we haven't really focused on. And it's a hole in the graph. And I want you to notice that at, at negative three, negative one eighth, there's actually a hole in the graph. It's not on the x-axis. The x-axis is actually a different point, but notice that I still have a Y value marked for this hole in the graph. Where did I get that from? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'd like to use number nine as kind of a springboard or segue into today's lesson. You can write it down in your notes. You can just watch. Um, it is number nine from the practice sheet. And again, we're gonna focus on exactly how to get the Y value as well as all the values that go with with that graph. Now, um, when I see this problem, uh, since I have been around algebra and so have you, I notice that the denominator can be factored. And the truth is, if something can be factored, you wanna factor it um, because often things happen when you factor. For one thing, you get kind of a different version of the equation. Now, when I factor this problem, it makes it very easy to see that there would be some bad numbers. And don't forget that bad numbers always come from the denominator. So I'm just kind of noting that I'm gonna get a zero in the denominator from these bad numbers. But it also makes it very clear that there is a common factor. And like we spoke of the very first day, although we haven't spoke of it since then, if you have a common factor, that actually means that there's gonna be a hole in the graph. And that hole in the graph is gonna occur at the X value that was the bad number. But let's go a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper. Let's, let's cancel these X plus threes. Wouldn't, wouldn't you be able to cancel X plus three when it's common? Well, yes, you would. Now notice that you create a different fraction, a, a totally different fraction that is uh, that's missing the x plus three, and more importantly, has the ability to receive, to plug in negative three. You see, I can actually plug x into this equation 
and I can get a genuine bona fide Y value. It's just the Y value that you get when you plug in negative three. And look, it's negative one eighth. Now what just happened here? Well, I found a bad number, it's negative three. And make sure that you realize that X equals negative three is still going to give us the position for the hole in the graph. But if I cross out, if I cross out that X plus three, I get a simpler, a sort of temporary simplified version of that fraction. And then I can plug into that fraction, my negative three, to get that Y value. And now I have not just the X value, but the X and the Y value for that hole in the graph. Now, there's still going to be a vertical asymptote from the X, the other X value, that is the X equals five, and don't do something silly like try to give me a Y value for that. Um, there are no Y values for vertical asymptotes. Is there anything else that we should be considering here? Well, sure, there's the Y intercept. Um, remember, the Y intercept just comes from plugging a zero into, that's right, into the original equation. Now, when I plug a zero into the original equation, okay, uh, this is completely separated from the other work that we did, that is canceling things and finding common factors. Just plug into the original equation and you get negative one fifth. Nothing really new there, but realize that it's not related to the hole in the graph. How about the x-intercept? The x-intercept. The x-intercept comes from setting the equation equal to zero. Now, when you set the equation equal to zero, I really should be going back to the original equation. So let me clean up some of this stuff. And I'm gonna set it equal to zero. And here's where I want to keep in mind that the only way to make this equation equal zero is to have the numerator equal to zero. But the only way for the numerator to equal zero is if x equals negative three. Now, x equals negative three, wait a minute, that's already been claimed. That's been claimed as a bad number. And so you can't have a hole in the graph and also have an x-intercept at the same place Think about it, it'd be silly to try to say that negative three matches up with zero as if it's an x-intercept and it also gives you a hole in the graph. So you can't have a hole in the graph and an x-intercept at the same place, okay? Because a hole is a hole and an x-intercept is actually a point. Well, when you go to make your graph, as you already saw on the practice sheet, but to kind of help you create it here. I can mark a hole at negative three and then negative one eighth. Uh, it's just kind of an estimation, but I can actually mark a hole there. The y-intercept is at negative one fifth. Uh, that, that is going to be a little bit lower. And then I did have a vertical asymptote over here at five. I should be putting that down regardless. Now, when you draw the graph, you can use your calculator but the point is, is that it's going to have to go through the hole. Of course, technically, it sort of jumps, uh, I really shouldn't say jump, but technically, it uh, uh, creates a hole, so I can't actually go through the hole, but it's going to um, connect at that spot that's a hole. It also passes through the y-intercept, and then I do end up with uh, the uh, rest of the graph uh, over here, uh, that is the part with the vertical asymptote. Um, geez, I can't believe I forgot the horizontal asymptote, uh, although we did find it back on the practice sheet, uh, would have been X e y equals zero, um, of course, because of the degree, and that horizontal asymptote fits nicely into this graph. Um, but it's the hole in the graph that we want to 
uh, focus on. And literally, it's like it's a pothole. It's a place where the Y value um, technically doesn't exist. Um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm not really sure I like the way I said that. It, it's the X value that doesn't exist. But I, I can still find the position of that Y value. I can still find the position of that Y value by working through that cancellation and that temporary fraction. So if you have a common factor, you're going to get a hole in the graph. If you have a common X minus A in the numerator and denominator. To find the exact X and Y value of the whole, in other words, to find the position of the whole. You see, it's kind of a strange idea. The, the X value doesn't really exist. And for that matter, the Y value doesn't actually exist. But I can still find the position of that missing spot of that whole. And all I have to do is cross out, cross out the common factor, and then use that temporary fraction when plugging in the X value to get the Y value. All I have to do is cross out the common factor and then use that temporary fraction, plug in that X value, get the Y value. That's how you get what is missing in the graph. Let's do super problem. Super tricky? Uh, not necessarily. Just lots of stuff to think about. We're gonna do a rational function that's got all kinds of goodies. It's got a numerator, it's got a denominator, it's got even a plus two at the end. Now, there's all kinds of approaches on this type of problem, but I'm gonna share with you one thing you really don't wanna do is try to like foil and simplify everything. Do you realize that the factored form is actually simpler? because when it's in factored form, we can already see the zeros. Now, if you're saying, yeah, but Mr. Nelly, you got this plus two, I wanna to try to like add plus two into this problem. Um, listen, why don't you think of the plus two more as like a vertical shift? And when you think of vertical shifts, there's only certain things that can do a vertical shift. So instead of trying to add two and create like a new fraction, we're just gonna take what we have and we're gonna start making our list, okay? Now, the hole in the graph ends up being the first thing on the list because honestly, it sort of takes precedence. So if you see a common factor, that means that you're going to have a hole in the graph at the point, at the bad number. Just start right there. You're gonna get a hole in the graph at that bad number, x equals one. Now the truth is I should be able to cross this out and plug in the number one. It's easy to do when I have like this whiteboard here, but I should be able to plug in the number one into my temporary fraction. Now what happens when you do that? Well, you get negative one in the numerator, you get one times negative two squared in the denominator, and you actually still have a plus two. Yes, you have to think about that plus two because a hole can shift up and down. So I believe I have negative one fourth plus two, right? And negative one fourth plus two is the same as negative one fourth plus eight fourths, coming out to be seven fourths. So I plugged in one and I plugged it in to my sort of my temporary equation. And when I plugged it in, I was able to get seven fourths. I'm gonna get rid of all of this uh, notation and scribble because I, I wanna be able to eventually have the original fraction to work with again. So. Uh, maybe it'd be better if I just kind of rewrite most of this, but we still have our hole in the graph um, at, of course, one and seven fourths, and we're ready to move on to the vertical asymptotes. Now listen, those vertical asymptotes, that concept hasn't really changed since the first day. 
it's still going to be the zero in the denominator. The one thing you just wanna realize is how silly it would be to say that x equals one is going to somehow be part of the vertical asymptote when we just said that it's a hole in the graph. So you can't have a vertical asymptote where you have a hole, but you can have vertical asymptotes at some new numbers at how about x equals zero and how about x equals three. Okay, so the other bad numbers just get sort of defaulted to be the vertical asymptotes. X equals zero and X equals three. How about the horizontal asymptote? Yeah, that has to do with the degree, right? Now, I don't need to foil all this stuff out to be able to get the degree of the numerator. I can see that it's gonna eventually be a degree two. Same thing with the denominator. I can see that it's gonna be a degree four. Now, according to the rules of degrees, this is going to give us a horizontal asymptote at zero, or better said, starting at zero. Yeah, it's gonna start at zero, and then it's going to shift up by two. So a horizontal asymptote can definitely shift, and that's why my final resting point is gonna be at y equals two. How about the y-intercept? Are you still with me here? We're gonna plug a zero into the equation. Now listen, when you plug a zero into the equation, you're gonna plug it in for all these x's. But there's one x that is a problem. It's this one. If I plug a zero in for that x, I'm gonna get a big old zero in the denominator. And I don't really care about all these other ones. In fact, I don't even have to show all that to be able to say that since we have a zero in the denominator, since the denominator becomes undefined, there is no defined y-intercept. There is none. Side note, there's a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. That's another reason why we can't have a y-intercept. How about the x-intercept? As we said a couple times, uh, you might uh, not have to find it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means we won't find it. That's because honestly, to set this equation equal to zero would be a lot of work and maybe the algebra would go beyond what, what we can do. But I believe there still is a y, excuse me, an x-intercept for this problem, uh, which we might be able to see from the graph. So speaking of the graph, let's kind of put some of these uh, features in place. I have a hole at 174, so I'm gonna sort of, uh, you don't really have to label it, but I'm gonna show you that I'm putting it in a place that kind of makes sense. Uh, I guess the truth is it would make a little bit more sense to be like right here. So I'm just gonna erase the 174s, but at least I have it marked somewhere that makes sense. Uh, in other words, by the scale of the graph. How about some vertical asymptotes, right? We've got some vertical asymptotes uh, that we definitely wanna mark with dashed lines. Now the horizontal asymptote is at two. I'm pretty sure two is just a little bit above seven fourths. So let's put the horizontal asymptote right there. This is pretty much it. The rest of this would be looking at this graph on a calculator. I uh, actually don't have that ready to show you, but I hope that you type it in a calculator. Uh, yeah, you'd have to type it in very carefully with uh, putting parentheses around the entire numerator and the entire denominator. Don't forget your plus two at the end. Um, you're saying, I don't know if I wanna do that. Well, you should so that you can see that you get a branch right here. Now you get a branch that comes down from that vertical asymptote, but it's going to connect with the hole in the graph. Of course, the calculator doesn't show a hole, uh, but you know that it's there as we found it to be at one seven fours. Don't forget you're allowed to cross a horizontal asymptote because they only apply to infinity. Since they only apply to infinity, it's only going to be this last branch where I start to get that behavior, uh, at least that end behavior. So we were able to come up with the features of that graph without really uh, uh, simplifying the problem better, just using the factored form and everything looks good. Tonight, your homework helper, it's kind of the final homework helper, put it all together. The directions are to use all the concepts to find those features and then and then get your calculator out so that you can sketch it
course, after you've already placed them on the graph, you can sketch and tie it all together in a nice little bow.